We're going to go into a panel uh, for 25 minutes on NFTs are global, your legal strategy should be two. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, your speakers today, which are, which are Moish Peltz, Morgan David, Avia Arika, and Jeff Bandman. Please give them a warm welcome. Shall we start? Good morning. How's everyone? Good morning, everyone. So I think we'll introduce ourselves. And yeah, so I'm Avia. I'm a lawyer. I've been in crypto, a crypto lawyer for around six years. Before that, I was in online gaming and been focusing on financial regulations and security laws around the world, mainly US and Europe. Uh, for the last six years, um, my focus uh, is global regulatory strategy. So I build the architecture for projects from a regulatory perspective, uh, with a bird's eye view of the world. I'm a part of, an, I'm a partner at Parad Group. It's a consultancy group and a law firm of 100 people, um, some in Tel Aviv, some worldwide. Uh, we consult um, many crypto projects. Uh, some of the biggest exchanges in the world, um, including uh, Binance, Kraken, um, and, and others, about their regulatory um, go-to-market and um, uh, risk management. So, um, yeah, and we're also, we have a large gaming practice and a lot of uh, gaming and crypto projects. Um, of course, they meet each other sometimes. So, yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm Jeff Banman. Um, Thanks for joining our talk. Uh, I currently am COO and uh, general counsel for a group of companies that are known after, uh, named after my uh, colleague, uh, Punk6529, who's one of the top investors, thought leaders, collectors of, uh, of NFTs, uh, and also a, a champion and advocate for open metaverse, uh, known for very long uh, tweet storms and advocacy around uh, there, and I'd say we're a mission driven organization around uh, promoting open metaverse, as well as the roles that NFTs uh, and their role is uh, enabling ownership of digital objects and a creator economy can have in making a Web3 that's more like Web1 than Web2. Uh, my path to, to doing this is um, I started my career as uh, a lawyer in New York and at various times in my career. I've been based in uh, New York, London, and Washington, DC. Um, I was a corporate lawyer, general counsel, then I switched from law to business, uh, rebuilt Kenner Fitzgerald's market data business after the events of 9-11, worked on a number of market structure initiatives uh, in New York and London, and then um, really first was exposed to crypto in late 2013, early 2014. You know, a former colleague uh, had called me up and said, Jeff, have you looked at this Bitcoin thing? And I was like, seriously, Dave, isn't that just for criminals and money launderers and terrorists? He's like, no, 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 there's a lot more, more to it. So I sort of, we brainstormed some ideas. Then I had the opportunity to be a financial regulator at the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or CFTC, where my day job was overseeing financial market infrastructure, working on international matters with other uh, regulators. But my you know, side hustle, in a way, after we testified to Congress in 2014, that we thought virtual currencies were a commodity and therefore of interest to the Commodity Futures uh, Trading Commission, uh, we, we stood up a working group and task force to do it. And I didn't know much, frankly, about it, but I knew more than anybody else. So I kind of chaired that group and worked on that and uh, eventually launched at the CFTC, Lab CFTC, which is their uh, innovation hub. Um, prior to doing the 6529 stuff, I was doing a mix of kind of teaching, policy work. I'm an advisor to a number of governments in Europe and the uh, uh, Americas. Uh, and you know, I jumped into 6529, I guess, a, a year and a half ago. And so there's probably not many people in NFTs who've sort of made the, the path from uh, regulator to NFT degen. But here we are. Well, how do I follow that? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Morgan. I live two very different lives. Um, my background is I'm a police officer in Hampshire. I was a priority crime um, officer, so that was all manner of frauds and deceptions and nasty stuff. Um, moved out of that into something equally as nasty, which is civil enforcement in this country. For those that have joined us from outside, there's two different enforcement routes in this country. Criminal, obviously, 
police um, and then civil enforcement. And the very pinnacle of that career is um, high court enforcement. So I'm an authorised high court enforcement officer as appointed by the Lord Chancellor. In relation to that role, there's only 50 of us in the country. Um, most of them are, are knocking on in years and I'm not quite there yet. But I, um, that, that previously took up 99% of my time. Um, in, as well as that, I, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Credit Management, a fellow of the Institute of Paralegals, and I'm a member of the London Institute of Banking and Finance. So all very boring and um, legally, no offence because there's three lawyers sat around me, but <laughs> there we are. So um, that's very compliant driven, we know exactly where to look. If we want to look at something, we can pick up a piece of paper, we can say that's what we need to do and that's how we need to do it. And it's steeped in, in history in this country because our role stems from the under sheriffs of the counties, which goes back to Robin Hood Day. So that's that part. Thanks largely to COVID, I um, was looking for low risk opportunities in the crypto space. Um, after lots and lots of research, all, lo all roads led to Cardano, so I'm probably one of a few people that's representing Cardano, but it, yes, yes, there's a few. So um, I thought, I loved going to Decentraland, so I'm chain agnostic with investments and, and especially NFTs and things, and I've, I've got a board ape, but went to Decentraland, loved the concept, it was very early, pioneers in this space, but to build and deploy anything meaningful there just, just didn't just didn't get it for me because I'm not a developer. Um, so I thought, I wonder, I wonder, could we do a similar thing but on the Cardano blockchain? And after watching a million and one Charles Hoskinson videos, I thought, yeah, let's, let's do it. So we launched it and we've sold out 100,000 land parcels. We've got over 17,000 unique landowners by wallet addresses. 75,000 in our Discord and our Twitter, really vibrant. We've got over 100 verified creators that are fully doxxed to us. And we're building what I think is, is one of the, going to be one of the leading metaverses across all chains, not just Cardano. Um, we're doing it with a legal, a legal, we're doing it in a legally compliant way, certainly in this country, because that's easy for me to establish with the help of the great law firms that I've used and the advice that we've had. We're horizon scanning as best we can. Um, we did take the, the sad choice to exclude American buyers from our early sales. I'm sure they probably got in anyway, VPN. <coughs> um, but where we find ourselves at the moment is I am spending 90% of my time de developing Pavia. The other 10% is spent meeting with MPs. I'm a member of Crypto UK, and I recently met a minister at the House of Commons, and we talked on the terrace about regulations and what's coming out of Europe and the online safety bill and all manner of things like that. Um, but obviously, we're global, so we still keep a base of operation in the Seychelles, which is where our tokens are in, uh, originate from, just in case the regulations change in this country. But I think, I think, I hope, they're true to their words, and we are going to make the UK a crypto hub. So if that works, that'll be great. And then we just need to um, get that to rub off on a little bit of our friends in America. So I will hand over. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Moish Peltz. I'm a partner at Falcon Rapport and Berkman, a law firm based in New York. Um, my background is in intellectual property, you know, protecting and enforcing trademarks and copyrights and drafting license agreements and all those things. Uh, but one of my buddies in 2014 said, hey, I'm starting a crypto mining company. Why don't you come help me? So I helped him figure out the, the legal framework for that and, and uh, got interested in, in Bitcoin and, and other altcoins at the time. And went back, you know, market crashed in 2015 and went back to my day job being an IP attorney. And then, uh, you know, 2019, 2020, uh, NFT started uh, kind of popping up again and uh, kind of clicked for me that, you know, IP... Um, is, is now crypto and, and crypto is IP and, and NFTs. And so I um, really shifted my practice from being an IP attorney to being a crypto attorney with an IP background. And, um, and it's, you know, to the topic of today, you know, uh, trademarks especially are very jurisdictional based. You think about a company, uh, I'm an e-commerce company, I'm selling t-shirts in the United States, I get a trademark in the United States. Now I'm going to, to you know, sell them in, in Europe, I'm going to get trademarks in, in the EU, right? Uh, so it's very jurisdictionally based. Um, 
but I, you know, e-commerce especially kind of starts bleeding that in the traditional world and now NFTs especially. Um, you have to figure out, you know, what's your, why well, not just your, you know, I'm, I'm a U.S. attorney and we were talking about this before the panel that, you know, U.S. attorneys kind of think, well, that, that's the only law that really matters. Um, but, but I think increasingly, um, I, th I think not just U.S. attorneys, but also the, the industry is realizing that you really need to have a, a, a more broader, uh, a broader focus of the legal strategy globally. So kind of tie that into... Yeah, I mean, from my experience, because we are working, so I'm based in, in Tel Aviv mainly, but I don't work with Israel as a jurisdiction. So we advise clients on, on a global perspective. And when um, when clients come to us, it usually it is divided to two. The ones that are completely against being regulated in any way, and that they just tell us, okay, help us avoid pitfalls, help us restructure or or kind of engineer our product around the pitfalls and those that are willing to go that, down that, that regulation road and you know either apply for an exemption in the US or, or get a license. So, and, and, and it's much easier to think about your approach as a founder from the start than to reverse engineer it. Because if you are starting a project, you're building a project, and then you are not taking regulation into consideration. You're just kind of saying, okay, let me get started, and then six months, 12 months into the project, I'll figure it out. It's gonna be much, much harder to reverse engineer uh, the project from a regulatory perspective, uh, because sometimes, because of the complexity and the innovation level of, of crypto projects, especially DeFi projects, and, and NFT, well, NFTs and DeFi are, are kind of combi being combined in many projects nowadays from what I see. It's very, very hard to, to do it retroactively. And another thing that I would say is if you are willing to go down that, that regulatory kind of mindset road and, and take that into consideration, you always have to think to prioritize your markets. So to think about which markets are most important for me and then take those markets into consideration, map out the relevant regulations in each market or um, build your prod product around what, what you can do in those markets. And I think 2023 is gonna give a lot of clarity um, to crypto regulation, not NFT specifically, but Mika is coming into force in Europe in 2023, and the SEC is waking up and probably going to issue guidances soon. You know, the CFTC, Jeff, Jeff will attest to that. But um, yeah, I think a lot of clarity is being uh, introduced, and I think it's good for the market because it will help it grow in a healthier way. Yep. So, um, you know, I think given the topic of the panel, NFTs are, are global, your legal strategy should be too. Um, you know, I've, I've found that, um, you know, I spent a lot of my time on crypto previously focusing on kind of policy and, and regulation. And so I'll make a couple of observations about NFTs from that perspective. Uh, but then I've also found that, you know, there are quite a number of other bodies of law, uh, you know, or frameworks that also are, are brought into uh, effect. And, you know, to me, first of all, like, I think that um, you know, I think the mental model that I have around NFTs, you know, it really evolved. Like initially, you know, it's like, hey, these are a bunch of, you know, silly JPEGs that a bunch of nerds are playing around with. And, you know, I noticed that at least the community of people, like it was much more of a consumer moment for, for people in the sense that, you know, people were really getting, uh, you know, emotionally connected to the different, you know, communities. They were forming different parts of friendships. And people were actually talking about, you know, the NFTs themselves and their collections and traits and, and whatever, and not just talking about, you know, things like the Byzantine generals problem or consensus mechanisms. So, you know, I think, but I think that's just the first step of NFTs. And, you know, I think what got me excited about, you know, kind of promoting N NFTs in the context of, of Web3 was really recognizing that, you know, Web2, you know, you don't own anything. Even if you put a photo on Instagram, it's, you know, under an, a user license agreement. You don't own your books from Kindle. You don't own your music from App, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on, but people get it. So I think there's, you know, an opportunity to have, you know, a true ownership society where people own their digital objects. And so I think, you know, it has started with art, art and music and some sort of cultural objects and obviously with, with gaming. But, you know, I think the path of NFT adoption 
uh, is going to eventually consume like like literally everything. I mean, the, you know, we're used to you know fungibility in digital assets because of cryptocurrencies, but most of the world, uh, you know, is is non-fungible, and people want things that reflect their individuality and uh, communities. So I think that brings into effect, if you start thinking of NFTs as being, you know, not just these cultural objects, but literally everything, it's intangible rights on the blockchain, you know, then you really need to start to think about not just the regulatory framework, but, you know, what's the IP framework? Is it CC0? Uh, you know, what do you want to give away? I think on the regulatory side, um, and I think I heard the panel to, to before this make this observation, like it really is possible to structure an NFT so that it may or may not be an offer or sale of securities in one, or, in one jurisdiction or another because of the way it's pooled, even if the underlying is that. Um, you know, it could be a commodity. I think Europe has a much bigger, broader definition of what a utility token is than in the US. A lot of my conversations with regulators now are either A, to convince them that it's just a bunch of stupid JPEGs and they shouldn't pay attention. Um, that's, you know, to working with, with some than, than others as opposed to important to societal definition. The other, the other point that I try to make is, is that, you know, there's a, a knee-jerk reaction by regulators to kind of put anything that's a digital asset under a financial regulatory structure. And, you know, a lot of these are consumer products. So, you know, some regulators have kind of started to absorb that and are still figuring it out. Uh, I think it'll be longer than 2023 before we get, you know, clearer guidance and the SEC doesn't seem to want to give guidance on anything. But hopefully you're, you're right and we can share the optimism uh, there. Maybe we can at least deduct about guidance because, you know, what, what's happening now with Board Apes and the SEC and what's happening, you know, in, in Europe, then I think we can at least kind of be able to deduct conclusions, if, if not, you know, proper guidance. Well, I think, I think that'll be interesting, right, as you see different jurisdictions, like, like MICA will, will kind of, there'll be a, a shot from the EU, and, and then you'll say, well, what's the U.S., gonna, are they going to respond, or are they just going to allow this uncertainty to fester for, you know, 2023, I think also is pretty aggressive to have any certainty in the U.S., but, you know, does that, does that change the way you approach your go-to-market strategy versus, you know, do, do, does, do you now have different jurisdictions that have different perspectives, but then you're, you're, you're ultimately selling the consumer object that is going to be consumed globally. When right? it comes to securities, by the way, I think the U.S. is always um, leading the way in terms of guidance when it comes to security laws and crypto, whereas Europe is more um, in the forefront of financial regulation and, and service providers, as in, you know, exchanges, brokerages, et cetera, um, because, you know, Mika is coming into force in 2023, and Mika is going to regulate kind of the service providers, whereas the SEC is always what people look for when they're trying to, to understand what is the benchmark for something to be considered a security. Yeah, well, but in the U.S., the, there's really, it's regulation by enforcement without much clear yeah. guidance. So you're looking at the Ripple and library cases, actually. I think the library case is really more instructive to, to this community than Ripple, perhaps. Um, but even if it's decided this month, uh, you're probably going to get an appellate process that'll take, you know, well into 2023, if not further. And then you still don't have guidance, right? You have a, a so it's, it's going to be very choppy, I think, for the next few years for me a regulatory perspective. And that's, again, not considering NFTs even specifically. Yeah. Do we I want to take a question or two? Oh, sorry. sorry, yeah, just really quickly on that last point. So this is, this, the focus of this is, is specifically NFTs. So I think at the moment, the, the, everything, the advice that we're getting and the things that I'm reading are that what's coming out of Europe um, is, is going to be widely accepted in the UK. They're talking about making the UK a global crypto hub. Um, that NFTs as such aren't, possibly aren't crypto assets, so that makes things slightly easier. However, we have this, this, this massive uncertainty of, of regulations in the US yeah. that nobody really knows what the SEC is going to do, and as you quite rightly say, that it's, it's, it's regulation by enforcement. Yeah, so yeah. The, the guidance that we, not, on, not official guidance, not financial advice, is um, to approach things with the best intentions um, and whichever country you, you reside in and where you're working from, where your base of operations are from, get the relevant legal advice in that country first. Get your ducks in a row. Do things correctly. Don't try, try and I don't know, spin up a DAO or some clever way of, of, of trying to avoid things, but say, 
get some professional legal advice, at least read the things yourself. Look at what's going on. Don't just take it from mainstream media or Twitter, and then expand out from that base of operations. Now, we still did that, but we also issued our tokens, as I say, from, from the Seychelles, just in case we get any non-favorable regulations in this country, then they're issued from somewhere else. So it does give a layer of protection, but everything we've done at the moment is completely, completely think, here. By the way, I think NFTs, the interesting thing is, um, it's going to kind of be a bit more divided, as I see it, into utility NFTs and NFTs that are in more, you know, more behaving more like investment instruments. So I see many founders baking utilities into the NFTs to, to draw them away from being considered securities. Um, and that's becoming very popular. Um, and a very interesting uh, segment that I see is music NFTs. That, that, that's really, I mean, that's so, much, so needed, but so legally complex at the same time. Um, from, uh, security, from the securities laws perspective when it comes to fractionalization and, and fundraising for albums and all that. So, uh, yeah. That's Equally, so like that's very, very quickly on that one, just want to follow that. Um, yes and no, because an NFT at the moment, our, our, we could argue that our NFTs are a, a placeholder or a, an in-game asset. If we then took that NFT and we put it into a smart contract, which was bonding or vesting or staking of some mechanism, and then we rewarded people with a fungible token, then we're getting into that very gray area that, okay, if it was a fungible token that we were doing it with, that's absolutely false foul of the security regulations. In this country, we have to be regulated by the FCA to do it. If we start doing it with NFT, at the moment we can go, oh, NFT is not crypto asset, and that doesn't cover it. So, but we want to build something meaningful longevity for, for decades to come. So I think people have to proceed with cautious optimism when they, when they start to do things with NFTs. That collection are, can still be considered a series. A collection, I mean, in, in some jurisdictions, can, right. can still be construed as a series of, of securities. Yeah, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a regulatory minefield, right? But I think if you get it right, it, I, I feel very blessed to be, <laughs> be British. Um, if, if, you, in a, if you're in a jurisdiction, there you, you can set routes and get legal advice and, and keep it compliant, that's great. Otherwise, you take your laptop and you sit on a beach in the sun somewhere. I, I'm per personally less optimist. I wish I could share your optimism about both uh, the UK regime and also uh, the SEC. I think the SEC, um, you know, Matt Levine, who writes a great daily column, says, you know, Gary, Gary says the rules are his to write, but he doesn't want to write the rules. And, you know, they, this is the regulation by enforcement. And I think, you know, a lot of people want to comply, but they, you know, they, they complain that there's a lack of clarity. And the SEC hears that as, oh, these are people who are just making excuses. But, uh, you know, I think I've seen it personally enough that that's not how I read it. Yeah, just quickly. Thank you very much, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Just uh, that's the end. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks. Okay, go on, man. Go on, go on, go on.